praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Bless your name, Lord. Glory to you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. That song you're playing, we need to go ahead and sing it because the Holy Spirit is going to be speaking to some people today. And He wants us to listen to this song and pay close attention to what we're going to be saying as we sing it because He is going to be speaking to you. Those of you here and those of you who are watching, wherever you are, focus in, really focus in on what we're doing right now. Praise God. Hallelujah. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice hanging on every word. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of
one of the things that we need to learn to do more and more is to hear you to listen to you too many Christians father they just they don't even believe that you speak anymore and yet as our father you do speak and you've commissioned the Holy Spirit to speak unto us father your desire is for us to hear you but as long as we are listening for an external voice or we're waiting for some kind of physical experience. We're looking outwardly, we're not looking inwardly. Because Father, you're a spirit and you commune with us on a spiritual level. So Father, my prayer for me, for everybody listening, is that we would be far more attentive to listening within instead of listening without. That, Father, like in your word, we would be still and know that you are God and listen for your voice within. That, Father, by hearing what you speak, we would clearly understand what you want us to do. So, Father, may we learn to hear you more clearly than ever before. And I thank you for this, because that is your desire for us and this morning father may we hear you speak i know that you'll deal with each person here and watching and listening in a way that's different from all the others because you will speak to us relative to what we need to hear from you so father may our hearts and minds be open to receive this from you and may your will be done and jesus thank you again so much for being our savior our Redeemer, our Sanctifier, our Healer, our Peace, the glory and the lifter of our heads. We thank you so much, Jesus. Thank you. And thank you that because of you, our names are written in the book of life. Hallelujah. Thank you. So Jesus, all the glory and the praise goes to you, and we rejoice in the joy of our salvation. Your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Guys, why don't you take a moment or two and greet some people because they really need it.
Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good to see you guys, all of you who are watching, wherever you are. It's good to see you by faith. Thank you for being with us. Praise the Lord. I like being at this church. <laughs> you say, well, that's a good thing, you know, because I hear the pastor. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here too. And, uh, you know, you're a blessing. Really good to see Luke and Claudette all the way from Canada. Isn't that neat? They came down to be in church with us. and It just so happens that their son and his family live in the area too. <laughs> but we know why they really came. Yeah. It's to, to be with all of us. I mean, why else would you drive 12 hours, right? <laughs> But it's so good to have you guys with us today, and, and everybody, wherever you are, I'm, we always get um, you know, new viewers and so forth. And so thank you. Wherever you are, thank you for watching, even if you're watching this archived uh, because of the time zone differences and so forth, or maybe you're watching it archived because uh, you have your own home church, but you also watch our services later on. Just you know, thank you. Thank you for being with us. I appreciate you uh, taking this time. Uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to uh, give in the offering today. Um, you know, your giving is helping. You know, I've said that so many times, but it is. And you're making a difference. And I know that over the years, so many times there have been preachers who have, you know, they mean well, they honestly, I think they're trying to help folks. But, you know, when they say things like God's going to bless those who, you know, uh, Every person who gives $500 today, there's a special blessing for you. You know, that means the people that don't have that amount to give, they, they don't get a blessing? I mean, come on. That's just not right. Uh, years ago, I bought into things like that, and when I would hear it, I'm trying to figure out, well, how can we give that much to get that kind of a blessing? And uh, I honestly don't believe that the preachers were trying to deceive people, but they were deceived. They, were, they meant well, but they were deceived. And they thought they heard from God, but they hadn't. God doesn't play games like that. You know, we're complete in Jesus Christ. And Romans makes it very clear that God along with Him gives us, freely gives us all things. So it's not based upon my money. It's based upon my relationship with Jesus Christ and what He did for me. So this morning as you're giving, don't feel like I'm not able to give any more than what I'm giving today. You know, don't, don't feel like that because you can't give any more that God is really disappointed in you. Because, you know, I personally believe you're giving what you can. And, and that you're not putting yourself in financial straits and so forth. So don't get under that kind of condemnation. It's like, boy, if I could give more... I'd make God happier. You know what? He's already happy with you. You're his child. He's already happy with you. So thank you for your giving this morning. Uh, those of you who are watching, uh, same thing for you. Whatever the Lord has impressed upon you to give or what you would purpose in your heart to give, just be obedient to him. And you can give through PayPal. At the opening page of our website, there is a, um, a little message there that says, donate now or something like that little yellow box you can click on that give through paypal or you can mail your offering in and you can do that just mail it to the address that's there at the website but thank you so much i appreciate it and you are making an impact praise god so as the ushers are coming forward everybody go ahead and stand thank you gentlemen I guess Free didn't like that other plate. He goes, <laughs> Are you telling us you don't trust Jeff to, when you put your... <laughs> hey, Brother Lee, why don't you bail me out of this and pray over the offering today? <laughs> Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Today is the, what, 15th? Hey, that means that our bonfire is this coming Friday night. Wow. Isn't that neat? 
bonfire this coming Friday night here at the church. Uh, we've always had our bonfires in the past. We've always had them outside. <laughs> That's, that, that seems to work really well, so we're going to continue that tradition. <laughs> If you haven't seen the flyers that are flying around the church, bring hot dogs or a side dish, you know, covered dish. Uh, we'll be supplying the fire. <laughs> but it, we're going to have fun. Uh, cook out. And then right after that, the kids are going to have a late nighter here at the church. Uh, if you haven't, those of you who are kids, uh, if you haven't spoken to Jamie about this, or parents, if you haven't let Jamie know that your kids are going to be attending that, please let her know. And it's going to last until midnight, is that correct? Eleven. Oh, how about ten? Wouldn't you like to? I'm trying to help you out here. It ends at eleven o'clock. That means, parents, you have to be back here to pick up your kids at eleven. If you're not, we're locking them out of the church. They, I'm joking. <laughs> you just never know how some people are going to take these jokes, because they're really good jokes, I think. So nevertheless, parents, be back here by 11 o'clock to pick up your kids. And uh, they're, they're going to have, uh, do they need to bring anything to kids? No, kids don't need to bring anything. So just be sure to let Jamie know that you're going to be here. You're going to have your kids here. Praise God. I think that's pretty much all I needed to announce. Yes, yes, that's all. Okay, praise God. The message this morning, I already know ahead of time, I'm not going to get through all of it, so this morning will be part one, and tonight will be part two, give you the conclusion. We're going to talk this morning and take a look in Scripture, dealing with some, a major issue that has a uh, tremendous impact on Christians. In fact, I'm pretty confident to say that every single Christian has battled this at some point in their life. If you don't beat it, it's going to hold you back and it'll be the greatest challenge you've ever faced in going forward with God. It is a major anchor in the lives of so many Christians and I've spoken to Christians before that have dealt with this. Yes, I'm going to identify it here in just a few moments, but, you know, we, uh, we see in Scripture where we're told to mortify the flesh, mortify the deeds of the flesh. We understand what that means. It talks about, you know, just stop sinning. But there's another mortification that Scripture does not identify with that word, but it is implied by virtue of what is recorded in Scripture. And that has to do with mortifying our past. Because if you do not mortify your past, your past is going to hold you back forever until, you, until you're with Jesus. And this is a major problem for a lot of Christians. Uh, what I'd like you to do is put a marker in the book of Micah. You say, I didn't know there was a book of Micah. I don't think you should admit that publicly because that means you haven't been reading your Bible. Micah is in the Old Testament. It's right before the book of Nahum, which you probably never heard of either. And it's right after the book of Jonah. Yeah, Jonah, that's the, the whale book. And Jonah is right after the book of Amos. And Ray, Amos is right after the book of Andy. <laughs> Just seeing who's listening. Just, you know. Only the old people got that one. But put, <laughs> but put a marker in the book of Micah. We, and the reason I want you to do that now is because later in the service, when we go to Micah, I don't want to wait 10 minutes to read the verse while you're... <laughs> so anyway. Okay, now to continue with this. Dealing with our past is a major issue. And it is. If anybody tells you, well, I've never had a problem dealing with my past, they're, they're lying to you. 
They, they are lying to you. Because every Christian has gone through this to some degree. Some more than, than others. There are some Christians who they may even get to the point of contemplating suicide because of their past. I, I know for me, this has been a battle. I mean, for years I struggled with things from my past. And, and uh, really, I guess you could say it's, I don't know, been, well, I mean, even after Kathy and I got married, I, I struggled with my past, thinking about what I had done. You know, how I treated my sister. When I was, when we were kids, you know, growing up. How I treated my sister. How I treated my brother. The way that I disobeyed mom and dad. The way I smarted off to mom and dad. Things I did to other people. I mean, on and on it goes. And it's not like I would just sit around and try to think about, okay, what did I do bad when I was 10 years old? And try to, you know, remember, it wasn't like that. But there are triggers. And the trigger can be a song. You haven't, oh, I haven't heard that one in years. And yeah, oh, I remember, oh, man. The trigger can be a TV show. The trigger can be an episode of an old TV show. The trigger can be a movie. The trigger can be a sporting event. The trigger can be a series of words somebody else uses in the middle of a sentence. The trigger can be a fragrance. The trigger can be a, a road. I mean, it can be a picture in a magazine. There can be so many things that can just all of a sudden cause you to start thinking about something from your past. Now, we're not going to talk about good things from your past. We're talking about those things that you sit and think, man, why did I do that? And I know for me, you know, I, it was a battle, a tremendous battle. Everything would be going along okay. Everything's fine. And then for some reason, I start thinking about something that I did. And it might have been, you know, even something that, uh, the way I was mean to Kathy or whatever. I mean, just something from my past. And, and I would literally at times just stop everything I was doing and maybe put my head down on my desk in my hands and just start, you know, why did I do that? How could I have been such a jerk? How could I? Sometimes I might have even used words you can't use from the pulpit. How could I, you, you too, you've done the same thing, I know. How could I have done and how could I have been? Why did I do that? And, and then, God, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I'm sorry, please forgive me for the 100 million 11th time. Come on now. You've been there too. Those memories can just tear you apart. And a lot of Christians, they, I don't know, it's kind of odd, they seem to have this idea, I just want to be, and I'm going to, you know, nobody's actually said things like this to me word for word, but it's almost like they're thinking, uh, please pray for me that those memories would be erased. I, I don't want those memories anymore. Like, well, that's going to be kind of a fruitless prayer. Because once they're in you, they are in you. Your brain, the human brain is the greatest computer that exists. You have a greater storage capacity than all the computers in the world combined. And I'm not going to even get into all the thing about the neurons and the dendrites and the connections and how they pull information from each other and so on and so forth. There are some people who do not believe, Christians who do not believe, that everything about your past is stored in your mind. Well, that's an interesting theory. However, I don't know about you, but I can remember things going back as far as at least four years old and maybe three years old. In my own life. That's, that's way back. I mean, that's way back. You know? <laughs> yeah, I remember, I remember when we used to ride the dinosaur to church every time. <laughs> no, not that far back. <laughs> 
But I'll tell you a story. Um, many years ago, I worked at a hospital in the radiology department. And at times, things would get slow. So I would get a magazine and, and read it, or try to read some of it, waiting for the next patient and what have you. And some of the magazines that I would look at had to do with the medical field, like the radiology magazines and just, you know, whatever. And I, I remember to this day reading an article about a man who had gone in for brain surgery. Now, you know they can do brain surgery on you when you're wide awake. They don't have to put you to sleep. The brain itself really can't feel pain, which is interesting because of its connection as like the nerve hub uh, you know, of your body. And so many times what they'll do, depending upon the type of surgery, what they'll do is they will numb the skin. Well, first they kind of shave you a little bit there. And then, of course, some people don't need as much shaving as others. But then what they do is they, they numb the scalp. And once your scalp is numb, then they, they cut the scalp and they kind of like ah, peel it back. And then when they peel it back, they take this little cutter thing and cut your, your skull, and they just pop, lift your skull right off, and they set it aside. I know. <laughs> now, it sounds gruesome. Well, and I guess... <laughs> and then they, they start operating. And again, it depends on the type of operation they do. Well, in this article, and I don't recall what type of brain surgery they were doing on this man, but he was wide awake. In fact, some of the surgeries... The brain surgeries, you will be sitting up, you will not be lying down because of the type of surgery they do, the way they have to get to the brain. Well, anyway, this man was wide awake, and they were, the doctor was doing whatever. They were using, the doctor, the surgeon, was using some kind of an electric probe. And, and that's my term. I don't know what the medical term is for what he was using. But when he touched the man's brain, Instantly, the man was reliving an incident from his childhood. And he recalled it with absolute vivid clarity. He talked about how, oh my goodness, you know, now I don't remember the exact words, but he's describing this scene. I'm standing on the curb. I'm eating my ice cream cone. Now, he was a young kid, really young kid. And he talked about the kind of ice cream cone it was, what the temperature was like, what the air smelled like. He talked about the flavor of the ice cream. He talked about the car that was parked right next to him. He actually uh, uh, could remember the license plate number. I mean, he just went on and on in absolute, incredible, minute detail. But as soon as the doctor removed the electrical probe, he couldn't remember it anymore. Well, then he took the probe and moved it to another place in the man's brain, and immediately he's reliving another event in vivid detail and describing it. And so the doctor realized, okay, we're on to something here. Well, long story short, what this means is that those memories from your past are there. It just takes something to stimulate the remembrance. You know, uh, some people talk about, uh, boy, I tell you, I wish I could remember things like so-and-so does. Wow, you know, this person over here, they have a, a photographic memory. There's no such thing as a photographic memory. Not in most literal sense. You'll understand in a moment. And you do remember everything in that it's stored. Here, <coughs> here's the difference. Some people are able to recall the information better than others, but the information is there. This is the only difference. You know what makes a, a, a brilliant person a brilliant person? You know what makes an Einstein an Einstein? It's the ability to recall information and use it in a contextual sense. That's all it is. Because when, when you sat in your physics class Everybody heard the same information. You read the same textbook, all of it. But some people got straight A's, and you struggled just to make a C. But you all had the same information. Here's the difference. Assuming that you studied as hard as the A people, the A people 
we're simply able to recall the information better and put it in sequential order to know how to use it. That's all. That's it. That's what makes smart people smart. So it's not that they're smarter, it's that they're able to recall the information more efficiently than the rest of us. But the information is there. Okay, this is why a song can suddenly get you to remember a bad event in your life from 40 years ago. And those of you that aren't 40, just wait. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm talking about? It's in there. Okay, and you think, I wish I could just stop that. Oh, I get so tired of it. All right, you know what? You're not going to erase it. That, that would be the destruction of brain cells. Because once the brain cells are destroyed, unless there, there's another cell that contains the same information, all right, it's gone. You don't want that. You don't want that. Yeah, but Brother Martin, they're so tormenting. Okay. Why are they tormenting? This is especially in the area of sin. How many times have you thought back to sin that you've committed last week, <laughs> last year, whatever it is, and, and you go through the remorse all over again? Okay, why? Why is that? And the truth of the matter is, most people would probably say, I don't know. It just is there. Maybe I didn't repent enough the first time. All right, well, let me ask you a question. Did you mean it the first time? Well, yeah, I meant it. Okay, then why are you doing it again? Well, because I still feel guilty about it. Ah, okay. Why are you still feeling guilty? Well, because it was wrong. Granted, it was wrong. Here's the problem. God has one perspective of this, and we have another. And we tend to exalt our perspective of all of this above God's perspective. And we live in our world not receiving his truth. Now let's take a look here. In Hebrews chapter 10, turn over there. Hebrews chapter 10. Another problem with this is the fact that we live in a world that is really good in reminding us of what we've done. <clears throat> there are some Christians that may have this distorted perception of, well, you know, God loves and God forgives, so, you know, why should, why should I still be penalized for sins that I committed a long time ago? You know, the, the legal system, they still won't let me vote. Because I was found guilty of, you know, certain crimes and so forth. Hey, <laughs> we are not living in the eternity with God. We are living in a fallen world. And this fallen world has laws and that's the way it is. So, you know, just, okay, let me ask a question. Taking this a little step further. Let's say that you attend a church, the pastor was married for, you know, 30 years, and his wife dies. Well, a year and a half later, he begins dating another woman. Now, he's, you know, in his 50s, and she's in her 50s. Beautiful woman. And so they keep dating, keep dating, and, and it's obvious, okay, there, you know, there's something going on here. I mean, these, they look like they're falling in love. But you trust your pastor to keep it pure. And you truly believe that the relationship is honorable and lines up with Scripture. But then you find out that this lady, as she, you know, she's talking about her life. You know, you know people get together to talk about, you know, well, tell us, you know, where were you born? Where did you live? Where did you grow up? You know, that kind of stuff. Just conversation. You find out, well, you know, I got born again 12 years ago and filled with the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, my life has really changed. And, and, and you can tell this lady has, I mean, she has jumped into the Word of God with both feet. And she is spiritually mature. However, you also find out that prior to getting 
born again. She had been divorced five times. And now she's dating your pastor. Well, what do you think about that? Huh? That tramp. I mean, she... (laughs) I can't believe our pastor would be interested in a sleaze like that. What kind of a... Huh? Now, wait a second. She was divorced five times before she got born again. So, who's got a problem with this now? I do, Brother Martin, bless God. And and I'll tell you what, if that's ever you, let me tell you. (laughs) It ain't gonna be me. (laughs) I'm married, and that's it. (laughs) Okay, do you see what I'm saying? We're pretty good at exalting our perspective above God's. Society is one thing. But the kingdom of God is something else. Now here in in, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, sadly, the only way to... The book of Hebrews is one of those books to where you almost have to start from chapter 1, verse 1, and go forward. I mean, this book, maybe more than any, is that detailed. Anyhow... In chapter 10, verse 1, for the law, what law? It was the law that God had given to the Jews through Moses. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, okay? Right there it tells us that the law was not the thing God truly desired. It was a shadow. It was not the substance. It was a shadow. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things, or it was not that which was casting the shadow, can never with those sacrifices, okay, what sacrifices? The sacrifices, the animal sacrifices demanded by the law. The law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. Now, this word perfect, it doesn't mean absolutely perfect the way the world would describe perfection. But it comes from a Greek word, and and I'm not an expert in the pronunciation of all these Greek words, so, you know, grace, please. But teleio, and it means a completion or to reach an intended goal. So in other words, he's saying that these sacrifices as they were being offered could never get the person offering them to the intended goal. Okay, what was the intended goal? The intended goal is revealed to us in Genesis chapter 1. Let us make man in our image and our likeness. In other words, God intended for humanity to exist with his life and nature in a human body, a flesh body. And so he says, look, these sacrifices, you know, they were offered year by year, continually, over and over. They could not enable the comers or those offering the sacrifices. It couldn't take them to this place of completeness or enabling them to reach God's intended goal of this completeness because, verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. Now, this is an interesting statement. He's saying, look, the people that offered these sacrifices If going through all of the effort and everything required to offer those sacrifices could get this person to this place of completeness or to the desired goal that God wanted, well, they wouldn't offer any more sacrifices because once they've been purged, purged, okay, purged of what? Purged of the thing that required the sacrifices. 
Do you understand what he's saying here? If you are purged of the thing which was demanding the sacrifices, well then, why would you keep offering the sacrifices? This word purged, it's interesting because it implies that which is within no longer being within. You understand what I mean? You, you know, don't want to get gross here, but, you know, purging, you know, when you eat bad food, you purge. Okay, well... That's what this is implying. That's the, the revelation this is giving. That once you've been purged of a condition demanding these sacrifices, well then, you no longer are going to have to offer these sacrifices. And he says, once you've been purged, they should have no more conscience of sins. No more conscience of sins. Now this word conscience comes from a Greek word, suneidesis. I think that's how it's pronounced. Now, let's think about this. If you commit a sin, are you aware of that sin you've committed? Well, hopefully you are. What about all those sins you've committed in your past? Well, obviously, because that's part of what we're talking about here, those memories. Those memories. How could I have been such a, why did I do? I can't believe I did that. Oh, God, I failed you, and on and on it goes. So therefore, there is an awareness. But this word conscience of sins, it's not simply talking about, well, it's not talking about a remembrance of sin. This Greek, word is talk, this Greek word is talking about a conviction and an awareness of an inner nature. A conviction or an awareness of an inner nature. Remember, he's talking about being purged of something. And then he says here, once you're purged, you should no longer have a conviction or an awareness of an inner nature, an inner nature of what? Of sins. And that sins, it's not just acts of sins, but a condition of sin. So he's saying, look, once you've been purged, then you should no longer have this inner awareness and conviction that there is something in me, nature, that is of sin. Now, we're not going to do this right now, but Romans chapter 7 gives you a lengthy explanation of what this is talking about. So he's saying, look, people kept offering these sacrifices, but the sacrifices couldn't get people where God wanted them. Because if the sacrifices could have gotten people where God wanted them, they would have been purged of what had demanded those sacrifices in the first place, and they would no longer have had an awareness of a shortcoming, an awareness of a nature of sin on the inside. He says, but, verse 3, in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So he's saying, look, because these sacrifices had to be made Continually, I mean, year in and year out, they're giving, and then plus, you know, the, the, the big one at the end of the year where the, the, uh, the high priest would offer the, sin, the sacrifice, going to the Holy of Holies and so forth. But even throughout the year, they were offering sacrifices. And he's saying, look, the very fact that they had to keep doing this, it resulted in a remembrance or it reminded them, you're not where you need to be. Because if you were where you need to be, then no more sacrifice would be offered. So therefore, as long as you have this condition on the inside, you have to offer these sacrifices. He says, because, verse 4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins or should purge the individual of that nature. Wherefore, when he, Jesus, cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not but a body hast thou prepared me. In, now look here at this verse 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. It is extremely crucial to remember this verse. You're going to see it again later on. But not here. He says, now this is as though Jesus is talking here. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. In other words, <clears throat> God did this to remind the people, you've got a problem. 
And if you didn't have this problem, you wouldn't have to be killing all these animals. But it wasn't that it made God happy. And he says in verse 7, Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, talking about you know, law and prophets, to do thy will, O God. Okay, now, if God's will was being accomplished through all of these sacrifices, there would have been no need for Jesus to show up to do God's will. So the law was a shadow of God's will that would someday be accomplished. And Jesus says, I have come into the world not to be involved with all the, the sacrifices to reinforce that system, but to do your will, O God, above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Notice, again, just like verse 6, keep this verse 8 in mind. It's extremely important. Because here we see that the law demanded, demanded these sacrifices. And these were sacrifices for sin. So once the law was given, God said, okay, look, you know, you guys, you got a problem here. And you don't realize it because as long as you have a sin nature, you don't understand you have a sin nature unless something reveals to you, you've got a problem. So I'm going to give you the law, and the law is going to reveal to you your inability to live the way I desire. And when you mess up, when you commit a sin, oh, and by the way, I'll let you know what is sin, because I'll include that in the law. When you mess up and you break the law or you commit sin, you got to kill something, all right? You're going to have to, whether it's a bull or a goat or something else, you've got to kill it. But here we see a revelation. This really didn't make God happy. This really was not what he was after. Well, he said in verse, he says, verse 9, Then said he, you know, Jesus says, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. So what we've read about the law and the sacrifices, that was not ultimately God's will because God's will, ultimately, was the restoration of man back to the Genesis 1 condition to exist in the likeness of Almighty God, to, to be His life in this flesh. And He says, Lo, I come to do Thy will, O God. He, Jesus, taketh away the first, that He may establish the second. The first what? Well, the first covenant, but also the first law. Now, you say, well, what's the second law? Well, we can talk about the second covenant, but not, not to go off here on a rabbit trail. The second law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's the second law. That's, we can teach on that another time. But he established that, Jesus Christ, by virtue of his completed work here on earth. And it is through the establishing of the second covenant slash second law by the which will, okay, Jesus says, I came to do thy will, O God. And it is, verse 10, by God's will that Jesus completed, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. Now, I know that for all appears in italics. This is not implying a uh, once saved, always saved. It doesn't mean, well, you know, now that you've accepted Jesus Christ, that, you know, you never have to repent for anything and so on and so forth. No, what he's talking about is, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. In other words, Jesus Christ's body is only going to be offered one time. That's it. It's not going to be offered anymore. One and done. That's it. And in verse 11, he says, and every priest, this is the priest, all the priests under the law, standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins, <coughs> or it can never take away that which needed to be purged out of the individuals, that sin nature. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, what was that sacrifice? 
It was his body. He offered one sacrifice, his body, for sins forever. Meaning, no more sacrifices. It doesn't mean you can't ever sin again. It means no more sacrifices. That's it. He sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, what offering? The offering of his body for sin, final sacrifice, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. In other words, he's not saying, this is not, again, this is not an eternal security verse. What he's saying is, Jesus is the final sacrifice. That's it. There are no more sacrifices. He's the final one forever. And those who come to him, put their faith in him, they receive what the law could not do. They receive God's will established in their life, which is restoration back to the Genesis 1 condition. See, real, real quickly here. What happened in Genesis chapter 3 proves once saved, always saved is a fallacy. Because Adam had the same life and nature we receive when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He lived in absolute perfection. He didn't have lost friends to influence him. He didn't have filth on television. He didn't have a bar down the street. He didn't have prostitutes on a street corner. He lived in absolute perfection and he still found a way to sin. <laughs> if anybody had an advantage, it wasn't Jesus, it was Adam. Adam was brought into existence absolutely perfect with a perfect body in perfect conditions. And yet he started listening to what? A false prophet. <laughs> now, he says that for by one offering he perfected forever them that are sanctified. Meaning, we now through Jesus Christ can get to that place of being what the law could not do for us. Whereof, now look at this, verse 15, and this is really good. Well, of course, it's all really good. <laughs> Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. He's a witness to us. Okay, remember in Romans, it talks about how the Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Okay, here we see the Holy Spirit bearing witness to us of something else. For after that, he said, so here we have a revelation of what the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to us of. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering of sin. So the Holy Spirit is trying to remind us, okay, remember this. Remember this. This is the covenant that God had wanted. Not the law. That he's going to put his laws into your hearts, into your minds, they'll be written, your sins and iniquities, he'll remember no more. And where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. There's no more offering for sin. The, here, see, the Holy Spirit's bearing witness with our spirit. You're the child of God. You're a child of God. But along with that, he's saying, hey, <laughs> you now are a recipient of the covenant God wanted the whole time. That covenant has been established in you. Previously, the covenant had to be written down on parchment, etched in stones, and all this other, so that people could read it externally. But now, God's character has been established in you because Jesus Christ has established the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and a new covenant with better promises, and this is now a part of who you are and what you are. The Holy Spirit is bearing witness with our spirit. Listen to this. The Holy Spirit is bearing witness with our spirit that God has established this in you, not outside of you. And where he says, I'll put my laws into their hearts. That is your nature. 
That is your spiritual condition. And where he says, in your minds, I will write them, that is your conscience. The conscience of your new nature. And then he says, and not only that, but God has declared your sins and your iniquities will he remember no more. He will remember no more. It isn't that God has a problem recalling. Do you remember what I shared earlier about how we can remember things going back into our childhood? Sins we committed when we were 12 years old or younger? Stuff we've done that we regret that we know is wrong? We remember it. God has placed in us the ability to recall information because he's the one who is the ultimate recaller. Does that even make sense? Meaning God never forgets anything. Meaning God's mind is never erased. But what this phrase means, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That in the Greek, that is a phrase that was used in those days to tell people what they had done in the past could never be used against them in the future. Never, 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 never be used against them in the future. So God is using this legal term and he's saying, your sins and your iniquities, I'm not going to recall them against you ever again. And the Holy Spirit says not only that, but where remission of these is, There is no more offering for sin. I want you to let this sink in here. Here I am, you know, everything's going along. I'm having a great day. Then all of a sudden I hear a song. And it's like, oh man. And that song brings back memories of something I did, a sin. And I start thinking, oh man, well, and it's like a a bunch of domino. You know the dominoes, you set the dominoes, knock one over, boom, they all go down. Okay, well, then that memory triggers another memory, triggers another memory, triggers another memory. Before you know it, I've got all kinds of sin remembrance dancing around in my head. And I I just want to find a hole, crawl in it, and put the dirt back over top of me. and, And so nobody can find me. I don't want to be found. I don't want to be looked at. I don't want you to know that I exist. Can I erase my existence from humanity? I mean, God, can I do this? Now, that sounds extreme, but some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're dealing with this stuff. Okay, now, how many times have we repented for the same thing? How many times? Now, we think, well, maybe I didn't mean it the first time. Yeah, you did. You meant it the first time because you felt bad about it. And you, you repented. God, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. You know, I did wrong. And, you know, however you said it. Okay, now, at that moment, do you understand? You're forgiven. And that sin and iniquity, God is never going to hold against you again. Never, never, ever. Why not? Because Jesus Christ was the sacrifice for that sin. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. In other words, you commit a sin. You do wrong and you know it. Conviction. I feel bad. Father, please forgive me. You know, I just, I'm so sorry. You know, in John, it talks about if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. First John. To forgive us our sins, cleanse us of all iniquity. Okay, Father, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. You know, I, I just, I know I did wrong, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and, and just, you know, I thank you. I thank you. Okay, now, have you been forgiven at that moment? Have you? Been, okay, the, yeah, the answer is, some of you got it right. The answer is yes. <laughs> You've been forgiven. Now, at that moment, has that violation of holy law been removed and filed away. <laughs> now you're not so sure. <laughs> the answer is yes. It's, been, it's gone. It's, it's not that God erased his memory. It's just that now he's not going to hold it against you. And if he tries, do you know who's going to be your advocate? Jesus Christ is going to say, whoa, whoa, father, hold on. Don't want to start any trouble up here in heaven, but (laughs) remember they appealed to your grace and your mercy and my completed work on the cross. And the father says, oh yeah, they did do that, didn't they? Okay, leave that one in the file cabinet. 
He can't pull it out um, legally in the United States. We refer to that as double jeopardy. You can't be tried for the same crime twice. And so therefore, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Okay, now, capture this image. 20 years later, you start thinking about what you did. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. I, I know I, that was so bad. I, I just wish I hadn't done that. Oh, oh, man, I feel so bad. I just feel so bad. I just want to crawl. I don't even want to crawl into bed. I want to crawl under the bed. I feel so lousy. God, please forgive me. And he says, okay, for what? Well, because, you know, don't so many here. He says, well, I'm not really sure what you mean. Because <clears throat> according to my records, you repented for that 20 years ago. Now, <clears throat> based upon the completed work of my son, Jesus Christ, who just happens to be your savior, you are forgiven. And I'm not going to recall this against you ever again. Therefore, number one, you are repenting for something that according to my records does not exist. And number two, now listen to this. There is no more offering for that sin. There's nothing left for you to appeal to. Do you understand this? There's no, there's no more. His body was offered once and for all for that sin. It's not going to be offered again. It's over. So when you go back and you start repenting again for the same thing, again and again and again, there's no sacrifice to appeal to. Because you already appealed to the final sacrifice, and the final forgiveness was given, and Jesus is not going to be crucified again for your memory. Because that's all you're dealing with. You're no longer dealing with an act. You're dealing with a memory. Because as far as God's concerned, the act is over and done with. It's, you know, quote, under the blood, as they say. It's done with. So where's the problem? It's with me. Because I keep remembering this. Now, I want to show you something in the Old Testament that, that, will, that will tie into this. This is a passage... No, don't turn to Micah. Yeah, we'll get this. <laughs> I know where we're going. No, you don't. <laughs> <clears throat> this is a story that literally for years had me stumped. And I mean, I had no idea what was going on. But by the time I'm finished showing this to you, in my opinion, it is one of the greatest prophetic passages of Scripture you are going to find anywhere in the Bible. Now, you'll understand this when we're done. Turn over. I don't know if we'll be coming back to Hebrews again uh, today or not, or this morning, but turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now, this is a story that's very familiar to a lot of Christians. We'll pick it up here, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still in Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned to her house. Now, we can debate all day long about why in the world did this happen. You know, what was going on here? How, how could such a situation take place? Well, you know what? Regardless of how it ended up happening, it happened. All right. Well, verse five. Some time has passed. And all of a sudden, the woman, Bathsheba, 
it says she conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now, I don't know about you, but I can tell you for a fact right about now, David had that everything in it that just dropped sick. Oh, my goodness, that feeling. And David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when, David, and when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him um, how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. In other words, it's like, well, how you been, buddy? Um, how's your dog? How's your cat? How's the grass? You know, um, how's the car running? Whatever. You know, small talk. Well, then David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. Now, that's just gross. I don't, <laughs> a mess of meat. Okay, why don't they just say like a steak and a hamburger or something? A mess of meat. Uh, you know, I just imagine some of these guys, when they were translating it into English, you know, they sat around and laughed. You know, someday people are going to read this, a mess of meat. Har, har, har. Well, anyway, verse 9. Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and went not down to his house. And when they told David, saying, Uriah went not down into his house, David said to Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife as thou livest? And as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. David said to Uriah, uh, hmm, okay, well, tarry here today also and tomorrow. I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him. And he made him drunk. Okay, he's just adding sin on top of sin. Because there's stuff in the Bible about, you know, don't get your neighbor drunk. Well, anyway. And even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. You do, you do know what's going on here, right? And he's trying to get Uriah to be marital, you know, with Bathsheba, so they can blame the baby on Uriah. But Uriah will have none of it. Now keep in mind, his wife is extremely beautiful. Now, the reason I'm saying that is, never mind. Verse 15. <laughs> David's got to be wondering, his wife is a fox. What is wrong with this guy? <laughs> well, he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. Sin upon sin upon sin. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah into a place where he knew that valiant, valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. And charged the messenger saying, <clears throat> When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approached ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall? Who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerushabeth? And, and, not a woman cast a spe and did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why went ye nigh the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us in the field and we were upon them even unto the entering of the gate, and the shooter shot from the wall of thy servants and at the, upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. <clears throat> I noticed the messenger did not give David time to get mad. <laughs> then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now that phrase displeased, it literally means was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Well, verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, 
And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The, man, the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had uh, bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was, uh, that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. Let me tell you something. Those are the words you never want to hear. Thou art the man. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of, his son, of this son. For thou did it in secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Okay, stop right there. What was the penalty for adultery? Stoning. You die. I don't recall reading anything in the law which said, and if thou commits adultery, thou shalt offer 500 bullocks and 300 goats. I don't remember seeing anything like that. And so here we have David. He's guilty of adultery. He's guilty of lying. He's guilty of, well, conspiracy and the death of another man. And David says, I have sinned against the Lord. That's it? That's it? And Nathan says, the Lord hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Excuse me. Wait a second. That's all you have to do? Just, I have sinned against the Lord. That's all? And this bugged me for years. As much as David is a great guy, God's just going to let this slide? What's going on? There's got to be more to this. Well, yes, that's because um, David was one of Jesus' ancestors. So God couldn't kill him. Otherwise, Jesus couldn't come along. No, that's not <laughs> the answer. I mean, it sounds good. That is not the answer. And so for years, I was really stumped until one day I found the answer. Would you like to know what it is? For a love offering. <laughs> no, I'm not going to make you wait till tonight for this one. I'm going to show you. Turn over to Psalm 51. Now remember what David said in verse 13. I have sinned against the Lord. It seems so short and so insincere. And then Nathan says, all right, well, you know, God's forgiven you, and not only has God forgiven you, but notice what he says. Well, you're in Psalm 51. He says, the Lord also hath put away thy sin. Put it away. Put, that means it's gone, and I'm never again going to hold you accountable for it. But David, there's no record in Scripture. David offered a sacrifice. There's no record in Scripture <clears throat> that he did anything. There's no record that he went to the priest. and I mean, it's, it's not in there. But now look at this. 
In Psalm 51, many Bibles may not have the first part of verse 1. Here's what it says. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So what this means is, what we're getting ready to read is not simply what's recorded in 2 Samuel, as in, I have sinned against the Lord. We are getting ready to read what happened the moment Nathan confronted David over this sin. Here's what David said. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He's admitting, confessing. He says, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Now, somebody might say, well, I don't understand because he did wrong to both Bathsheba and Uriah. Yeah, but Bathsheba and Uriah weren't the ones you stand accountable before. That's why he's saying, God, I've sinned against you and you alone because you are God, not anybody else. You're the one that I violated in these acts that I have done. You're the one I've sinned against. He says, behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. This verse 5 is a revelation of the acknowledgement of the sin nature that is within man when man is born. How on God's green earth did David have this revelation? It is so prophetic for the body of Christ. Well, as far as why Jesus came to earth. And he says, behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Okay, what is it that God did when we got born again? His law... He, was, he put it in our minds. He sowed it in our hearts and so forth. He says, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. You're seeing him prophesying what's going to happen when we're born again. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Okay, this phrase bones which thou hast broken, it does not literally mean that God broke bones. What it's talked, this was a phrase back then that they used when they were identifying the fact that I've done wrong against somebody and that somebody is now holding me accountable. And he says, verse 9, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Created me a clean, are you starting to see how prophetic this is for the completed work of Jesus Christ? He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. You, you couldn't be converted back then. You see this? This, is, this? this revelation that we're seeing here is so powerful concerning what we have in Jesus Christ and essentially a variation of what we just read over there in, in Hebrews chapter 10. He says, verse 14, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Now look at this, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. Where did we read this earlier? Back over in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 6 and verse 8. And he says, now look at this, look at this revelation, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. This tells you why God didn't hold him accountable for the sacrifices. Because in this passage, David is giving us a revelation that literally would have come from the heart of Jesus Christ. And that David is saying, God, I understand. It's not about killing animals. It's not about shedding their blood on a stone altar. It's about the condition of my heart. What you're after is somebody whose heart is truly repentant, whether they kill an animal or not. Because God, I could kill an animal and still have my heart not repentant. But God, you're looking for somebody who has a repentant and a contrite heart. And I come before you on the basis of my heart. I admit I have sinned. And I ask you out of your loving kindness and mercy to forgive me for what I have done. This is what David was saying 
when Nathan said, you're the man. In 2 Samuel, all it records is, I have sinned before the Lord. This is the detail of what he said. And God saw his heart and God realized (laughs) this man is the foreshadow of my son Jesus. And he is speaking forth those things which shall be revealed and completed through my son Jesus Christ. He's coming before me on the condition of his heart. And he is begging me. Let me say it like this. He's begging me prophetically for the born again experience that I can't offer to him at this moment. However, what I will do for him is the same thing I did to Abraham. I will lay righteousness to his account until the day my son completes his work on earth. Praise God. Praise God. I here's the thing. Go ahead and turn over to Micah. From that day forward, from that day forward, Nathan had given, go back and read it in 2 Samuel, Nathan gave David the revelation, God's not, God has laid this away. He's put this away. He's never again going to hold you accountable for that. In other words, he's never going to demand of you any more repentance, any more animals, any more anything. God has laid this aside. Now, (laughs) there were plenty of people who did know. Joab would have known what happened. Bathsheba, she definitely knew what happened. In other words, here's what I'm getting at. Every day of his life, there were conditions around David to put him in remembrance of what he had done. But God was not going to remember it. God was not laying this to his account any longer. Now look here in Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Now, where's the problem for us? If God did that for David, and we see the revelation of what God said in Hebrews chapter 10, how come it is we continue to struggle with the memories of what we've done? Why is it we let those feelings of our past be the anchor to our future? It's because we're exalting our self-perception over God's revelation. This is how I see me, God. I see me guilty. I'm guilty of this. I know I've repented 15 times for it, but I see me as guilty. I, now listen, I feel the burden of this sin. No, no, you don't feel the burden of the sin. You feel the condemnation. And that condemnation is not coming from God. You're not even feeling conviction. Because once you repented of it, God is never going to convict you of it again. The problem is we struggle accepting that it's over and that God no longer holds us accountable. We struggle accepting the fact that I am really forgiven for what I did. Remember the illustration I gave a little bit ago about the pastor and was married, his wife dies and time passes, starts dating a lady and before she got born again, she'd been divorced like five times. Christians, they, they not even sure if they want a woman like that in their church. They don't care how long she's been born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, and how obviously mature she is in the Lord. Doesn't matter. You did what? You did what? Oh my goodness. Our pastor shouldn't be hanging around people like that. You know what? If you go to God and start praying about it, And you say something like, God, do you know what this woman's done? (laughs) He might just say, what are you talking about specifically? Well, she was, that woman's married and divorced five times. Just like that trampy lady in the Bible. Oh, wait a minute. You mean the Samaritan woman? The one that my son restored? The one that my son did not condemn? Even though she was living with somebody that she wasn't married to? 
Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> How can our pastor hang around a lady like that? Right about now, I don't know if God will be getting angry or start to cry. Because we judge people by the standards of society and religion, not by the Word of God. The problem is we do the same thing to ourselves. We judge ourselves by a standard that does not exist in Scripture. And because of that, there are so many Christians, I'm not worthy. <clears throat> okay, why not? I'm just not because of what I did. You know what? You may have a lot of people. There may be some churches won't even let you in the front door because of what you did. But have you repented? Yeah, I have. Did you mean it? Yeah, I did. It's over. <laughs> it's over. It's over. How did I deal with this? Well, number one, it didn't, how I approached this, it didn't mean that those memories don't try to come back. They will. It's inevitable. They're going to. You say, well, gee whiz, that's encouraging, Brother Martin. Thank you very much. No, they're going to come back, but here's, here's the deal. <laughs> when they try to come back, it's like, no, no, uh-uh, no, 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 no. I am not reliving that. Yeah, that happened in my past, but I repented of it. I'm forgiven of it. Jesus paid the price for it. It's over. No, I'm not living there. I'm not. I'm not doing that. No, no, no. Uh-uh. It's over. Over. Okay? It's over. It's like I'm talking to myself, you know. <laughs> that's how you have to deal with it. Because that's part of what the Bible talks about, casting down imaginations and every high thing, all those thoughts that it, Exalt themselves above the knowledge of God, you know, bringing those thoughts into captivity. That's part of what that's talking about. It's over. If you let your past continue to haunt you, it's going to be extremely difficult for God to take you further into the fullness of His will because you're still trying to deal with things that don't even exist. Okay, I don't, I don't know what kind of car you drove 20 years ago. But I'm guessing you don't have it anymore. So therefore, let's just say that it was a, a Ford. A Ford Fairlane. That's older than 20 years ago, isn't it? So let's just say you, you, you drove a Ford Fairlane, all right? Now that car's gone. What if I approached you and said, you know what? I, I've been thinking about this. I kind of like to buy that Ford. Now you're going to look at me and think, what? What Ford? You know, that Fairlane. Man, I haven't had that car for 20 years. I, I, that doesn't matter. I want to buy it from you. See, that doesn't even make sense. That's just plain, you think I'm really weird. Er. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it is with our past. That, that Ford was sold a long time ago. That car's gone. The sin, it's gone. It's over. Maybe society won't let you forget it. You know, I don't know what your past has been like as far as law and everything else is concerned, but look, when you repent, it's over. It's over and done with. You're going to have a lot of friends, you know, pseudo friends. They're going to do everything they can to help you remember your past. Okay, well, you really need those kind of people hanging around. Tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you two examples of this at work in, in the New Testament. Guys, we have to mortify our past. That doesn't mean it can be erased from our memory. What it means is, just like mortifying the flesh does not mean temptation will never come. It means I mortify the flesh, it will not give in to temptation. I mortify my past. It is not going to control my life any longer. It's over. It's been cast into the depths of the sea. Figuratively speaking, it's been cast into the depths of the fountain of the blood of Jesus. And I've got no business walking up to that fountain, sticking my hand in, and trying to find my past and pull it up. Because when I do, it's going to be covered in the blood of Jesus. It's over. It's over. Praise God. Go ahead and stand.
This is part of what the Holy Spirit is wanting to speak to people today. Is to let you know, like we read in Hebrews, bearing witness with you. Your past is over. It's over. And there is no more sacrifice that can be offered for it because the final sacrifice was offered and you're now forgiven. Praise God. Praise God. Man, see, when, when Christians get a hold of this truth, I'm telling you, there will be a breakthrough. And that breakthrough is going to be in the area of your emotions. And that perceived burden, you're going to be free from it. Praise the Lord. Father, I pray for all of us, <laughs> all of us here, watching, listening, that this truth would sink so deeply in us that we would, we would never again come to the place of struggling with memories of what we've done. Those things from the past that, Father, we would realize it's over. We are forgiven. There's no more sacrifice because the final sacrifice has been offered. And Father, we are free from the condemnation. We're free from the guilt. And we no longer have to answer for what Jesus paid for. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise your holy name. Bless you, Jesus. Glory to you, Jesus. I don't know how many people well, in this room watching or listening. There are some that really, this has been a major battle in their life. You need this message. You need this morning. You need tonight. You need it. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. All right, listen. If you're struggling with a physical anything, I have good news for you. By Jesus' stripes, you were healed. The healing for your body is alive in your spirit. It's the life of God. That healing is in you now. You do not have to have somebody lay hands on you, though that's not wrong. You don't have to have an oil anointed on you, though that's not wrong. You don't have to have people pray for you, though that is not wrong either. But that healing is in you. That healing is alive there on the inside of you. Now it's a matter of us believing the Word of God because we are complete in Jesus Christ. Oh, you're never going to turn your body into an immortal body. That is going to be a work of God someday to come. But we can live with a healed body until that time. Father, I thank you that by Jesus' stripes we were healed. I thank you for sending your word and healing us and delivering us from all sickness, disease, affliction. I thank you, Father, that the sick are healed, the maimed made whole, and that, Father, our bodies, they're as healthy as they can be. I praise you for this. And I give you the glory for it. And Father, again, I just call that healing a manifested reality in our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. And thank God for your healing. Just, I mean, you do this throughout the day. Just thank Him for your healing. Thank Him for your healing. Praise God. We're going to go ahead and dismiss. You guys have a blessed lunch, blessed afternoon, blessed nap, whatever you do. And just let God prepare your heart and mind for the completion of this message tonight, and we'll see you then.